Hello, it's Pastor Larson. Pastor Larson inviting you to our Bible study. The Lord loves to hear us pray. I'm a pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church, and I invite you to tune in on Sunday at 10 o'clock or to listen on YouTube as we repeat that as long as and as often as you want to study with us. And our subject is prayer. The Lord loves to hear us pray. He really does. So that's our topic. And here's what we've done before. Last time, we hopefully cleaned up, or cleared up some of the misunderstandings that people have about prayer. Now today, I'm looking for answers, okay? I'm looking for answers to this question. Is prayer optional? Don't answer now, please. How does the Bible encourage us to pray? Did Jesus himself pray? And how does the Lord's Prayer fit into my prayers? We probably won't get to number three today, but let's see how far we get. Let's get started with our first question. And we're going to dwell on this for um, several minutes because it's a problem. It's a problem because many people consider prayer as optional. Sometimes, even you and I treat prayer as something we can do without, something we can put off to another time when we feel like it. When we feel like it, are you, are you serious? Is prayer optional? Listen, people, if the Christian life is full of grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and it's a life of grace and we live in that, then since grace is without works, why work at prayer at all? Wouldn't you agree that God's will is done even if we don't pray? So if God's will is done without our prayer, why pray? Why pray? Anybody want to answer that question? Well, I'm not sure if last week when we were talking about prayer, one of the things we talked about in order to have a relationship with someone, uh, we have to talk with them and get to know them. And I think prayer is uh, certainly one of the ways in which we talk to our Lord. Uh -huh. um, and uh, even, though, even though he knows all of our needs, he wants us to call upon him. Um, for those things. Uh, he, wants, he wants us to get closer to him, and we can only do that through conversation for the most part. Pray to God and ask for him to show you what to do. All right. Anybody else? Pastor Larson, I agree with Judy because he wants to know where you're at, and he can only, I mean, he wants to hear you, just like Judy said, because it, he wants to know you're on the same program. <laughs> I, I hope you are, yeah. And we're working at that. that. That's something that's never completed, is it? So our prayers are, are never ended. They're, we're never done praying. Would you say it that way? Sorry. Well, I've got to get some things done. And you can pray while you do those things. <laughs> They're not uh, self-excluded. All right. Let's go back here. Is prayer optional? I'm going to keep asking that question, all right? It's a pertinent question. Here's another problem, and I think we ought to tackle it right off the top. Sometimes we don't know how to pray as we ought. Would you agree with that statement? Yep. How to pray, I'm including in that what to pray for. Or maybe even what not to pray for. There are so many things for which our prayers are needed. But right at the moment when we make time for prayer or say, now I'm going to pray. If you don't have a list, at least in your mind and heart, you might not know how to pray as you ought. Well, don't worry about that. Ask God for help in helping you to see the needs that are all around you, beside the needs that's inside you. 
your needs. I have some personal needs. I have lots of them. God knows them. He wants to hear from me. But here's my, my point. We don't know how to pray as we ought. And then we're going to ask for help in that. All right. Is prayer optional? We'll get some help from the scriptures from this wonderful eighth chapter of St. Paul's letter to the Romans. It's one of my favorite chapters, and I've heard this from other pastors and Christians many times. This is in chapter 8. May I have a reader, please, to read Romans 8, 26 and 27. Uh, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and he searches hearts and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. There's a lot packed into these two sentences, three sentences, two verses. And I think we ought to look at it more closely, don't you? So let's look at it a little more closely. The Spirit helps us. And certainly from the context, we can tell that Paul is talking about the Holy Spirit, not our spirit. All right. And then the admission on the part of St. Paul, this great evangelist and church planter, admits, because he uses the word we, we do not know what to pray for as we ought. And there's, the, there's a lot there. I don't know what to pray for. And there's the admission that we ought to pray for those things that are not on our minds and hearts at the moment. And there are things that are on our minds, but we still don't know how to pray for them. But here's the prayer promise. The Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us. What does intercede mean? Speaks to God he in speaks, our place. He speaks to God in our place. Mm -hmm. I think we've studied before how Jesus is our intercessor, how he's our mediator, and in a special way because he's the one who died, who shed his blood, whose sacrifice is acceptable to the Father, and that makes him our mediator, capital M. But here, the Spirit is a mediator or an intercessor. Did you ever hear of intercessory prayer? Yes. You certainly have. It's when we pray for... For whom? For, for others. For, for others. And for other situations. Mm -hmm. Now, here's how we pray. With groanings. With, with this unutterable uh, groan um, that is too deep for words. It's, it, it, can not, it cannot be translated, and we don't even know what those groanings mean, or we do, and we don't. We, we have a problem, and we don't know the solution, but we know God is a, as a listener. Then we, we come to him, and we say, Lord, I... I um, Mm. You don't know the words. But here's the good news. He who searches hearts, and that's God the Father, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Holy Trinity, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is one God, and in the mystery of the Trinity, which we cannot and won't even try to explain, the Father searches the hearts. He knows the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So there you have the Holy Spirit speaking to the Father. And he is speaking because he cannot speak otherwise than according to the will of God. Right? Right. And he who searches the heart knows the mind of the Spirit. So you have a perfect prayer going on that starts with groanings that we can't explain or articulate. I think 
and when you pray, you know, I always tell you that God is not an English teacher and you try to, <laughs> I think you try when you pray to speak in sentences that your English teacher would approve of, but you don't always get it right. And that's all right. But when you can't even put it into words, you have the promise that the Holy Spirit is interceding with the Father on your behalf and his, his articulation is perfect. That's a wonderful prayer promise. Whenever you do not know how to pray as you ought, you probably have some Bible verses that encourage you to pray. Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I hope that's on your heart, even if it's not perfect in your memory. It's in Philippians 4. I believe it's verses 7 and 8. You, you gave us a verse um, last week, Jeremiah 29. Yes. Come and pray to me and I will hear you. I thank you for bringing that up, not only that verse, but also something that we have lost in this translation called the Zoom Room. Uh, when we had it upstairs, almost every time, even sometimes when we had a PowerPoint, I had handouts every week. There was paper on the tables and some of you took notes and others uh, didn't, but you folded it up, put it in your Bible, your purse. You had something uh, tangible and something you could take with you. So you had the Bible verses that we were studying, if you wanted to, the other times during the week. But with this Zoom room, you don't have a copy. And my guess, Evelyn, is that you wrote down the, uh, the Jeremiah prayer promise. I did. Well, um... Esther, can I intercede a second here? Yes, you, always you, speak up. There's no one out of order. <laughs> I mean, if you wanted to, when you send us this, the Friday invitation, you could attach some kind of written up thing that we could print off those who, you know, have a printer. Or it would be there always. I'm not to say that you have to. It's more work because this is yeah. a wonderful job. I'm more likely to do it afterward. I have sent a copy to one of the people on our list that does not have the technology, and I haven't kept up with that. Uh, yes. But yes. I could send it. The reason I say afterward is there's a little bit of editing that goes on between Friday at 4 o'clock and Sunday and Saturday at uh, 10. <laughs> you just you understand. So let me uh, consider that seriously. And this is a tangent, but I think it's a very useful. And I thank you for bringing it up. Uh, because and then if you don't want it, you just simply hit the delete button. That's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful button about uh, our email. <laughs> you also can do unsubscribe. But I hope you won't. Yeah, I'll have to work on that. See if I can find a, a technically a uh, simple way to do it. But now back to this prayer promise. Remember that when you don't know how to pray as you ought, don't worry about it. Uh, uh, submit your groanings, however they are coming, and know that the Spirit is interceding for you. I bet you some, some of you didn't know that that was there. So let's go on. I want you to uh, share about the groanings, if you will, when might you groan in prayer rather than use words? I don't mean just because you didn't know the words. I mean, what kinds of things might might be occurring in your life or in the life of others where you just... Oh. You're in pain. Ah, that's one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm chuckling because it's so true, not because I think pain is funny. I think sometimes when people are down, and uh, we're probably seeing a lot of groaning right now during the pandemic, but when people are down or depressed, you sometimes just don't even know what to ask the Lord for, and you just say, please help me, Lord, please help me. Um, 
in your groaning to the Lord. All right. What other groans might occur? The spirit and he who, who watches on and knows what is the mind of the spirit. It's good to hear your voices this morning. Thank you, Pastor. A little bit on the wet side. Thank you, Pastor. I'm glad that you're with us. And, uh, yes, been there. I'm, been sure, there. <laughs> I'm sure that you have preached sermons on this verse more than once. It is a golden nugget. Groanings, too deep for words. Anybody else? When you're thinking about, uh, you know, um, outcomes, sometimes you don't know what outcome you want to have. Right. Because you're in a situation where, you know, there could be several outcomes and you just don't know which one to pray for. So you mm -hmm. might just groan to God, huh? For groanings. Into yeah. And uh, Bobby, you had something. I was just going to say, I have a lot of stuff going on on my plate. Uh, virtu virtual teaching is a lot of work. I got football and volleyball officiating. I just came back from uh, my parents' place up in New Jersey. Uh, we were up there and driving up and driving back down. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I put a lot on my plate, maybe, which might not be always good. But, um, you know, sometimes you got, I got to look to God and remember, uh, you know, there's a lot of good things going on. And I, I have a lot to be thankful for. But sometimes I'm just too busy. You know, that could result in a groan. <laughs> My to-do list is spilling off the bottom of the paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, uh, we can uh, take on too much. So since the Holy Spirit prays for us, why do we pray? <clears throat> That's an impertinent question. You understand the, the impertinence of that? I don't think any of you would ever say, oh, the Holy Spirit prays for me. I don't have to pray. But I raise the question, because there are Christians who don't pray or don't pray very often. I've often used this expression that people uh, treat prayer, they treat God as though he were the fire alarm on the wall only to be used in cases of emergency. And they don't call upon God unless, well, I, I can't do this. I must pray. Unless, unless all else fails. Unless all it. else fails. All right. Yes. And that's Listen. putting ourselves trying to fix the problem instead of uh, asking the Lord for our help and guidance in the problem. And, and uh, that is the problem. We are the problem. We are the problem. Okay. So why do we pray? I'm still asking. Because for a relationship to occur, you need to communicate. That's right. If you didn't talk to Frank at all, he would soon get the impression there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's happens in marriages, but we're not going to talk about that today. No marriage counseling today. No. Is prayer optional? I want a reader, please, uh, someone else, uh, to read Hebrews 7.25. Consequently, he, Jesus Christ, is able to save the utmost, uttermost, to the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Yes, I put the um, Jesus Christ in brackets to indicate, of course, that you know that brackets usually indicate something added by the editor. Because in the, in the Greek, it's just the pronoun he. But from the context, we know that the writer is talking about Jesus. So he's able. He's able to save to the uttermost, I guess. No matter what situation, he can save those who draw near to God. Draw near to God it has to do with worship and has to do with prayer. It's the opposite of going away from God, isn't it? 
And if I draw near to God, it's because I want to talk to God. But now we have the phrase, through him. And again, the hymn refers to Jesus. He is able to save those who draw near to God through him. Why did I underline through him? We get to God through Jesus. Without Jesus, I would have no way to draw near to God because he broke down the dividing wall of hostility that stood between us because of our sin. Right? Now, how can he, why can he do that? And the writer explains, since he always lives, when? Well, since the resurrection. Mm -hmm. He always lives. He ascended to the right hand of God, and there he has been given all power, authority, and dominion. He always lives. We can sing the uh, Easter hymns here. All right? He always lives, and what does he do? Among other things, to make intercession for us. And here we have the combination of the Romans 8 passage where the Holy Spirit is making intercession, praying for us, and Jesus praying for us. Did you realize that, that Jesus prays for you? Mm -hmm. Boy, talk about a lot on his plate, Bobby. I don't know if... <laughs> but he's God. And he can handle it. He makes intercession for us. And there's another Bible passage that speaks about the same thing from Romans 8. <laughs> Go back to that chapter. Another reader, please. If you pardon my German accent, I can read it. Go ahead. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. For more than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us? Same thing, huh? Mm -hmm. So when you go and you pray in Jesus' name, this is included, and the one who died for you and was raised and is at the right hand of God. Did you know that there are at least seven, and some say nine passages that talk uh, about Jesus at the right hand of God? We say in the creed, who sits at the right hand of God, right? That little phrase, every time we say the Apostles' Creed, who sits at the right hand of God. Well, where is that in the Bible? seven times in the New Testament. Did you realize that? It's not a little thing. So he's at the right hand of God. Oh, well, that's a mystery. Right hand doesn't mean that chair on the right hand side of the throne. That does not, that means the right hand of God. The right hand is the, the, the place of power, dominion, and authority. And he, he intercedes for us, perhaps. I'm drawing more out of that passage than God put into it. But it, he, here's the idea. When we go to him in prayer, he's not condemning you. He's receiving and interceding your prayer to God the Father. All right? Well, here we have three things. Since God's will is done without our prayer, and since the Holy Spirit prays for us, and since Jesus intercedes for us, why should I pray? And I smile because this is, for us, an impertinent question. When I tell you those three things, God's will is done without our prayer, the Holy Spirit prays for us, and Jesus intercedes for us, you would never say, well, that I don't need to pray. I hope you wouldn't, but there are many, too many Christians who make prayer optional. And that's why I'm covering this, not just for you who believe that God answers prayer, he listens to prayer, that the Holy Spirit and the Son of God pray for you, but that you have friends and neighbors and family members who may need your help. Can you become, in a way, the God's teacher for a moment and tell them the many reasons for prayer? 
that can happen, huh? You think so? Mm -hmm. I hope so. You have much to share. Well, if you want to know if prayer is optional, you can go to one of the most earnest prayers who ever lived according to the record that he left and others left about him. Luther says in the large catechism on the subject of prayer, it is most necessary first to exhort and incite people to prayer as Christ and the apostles also have done. And the first matter is to know that it is our duty to pray because of God's commandment. Wow. For thus we heard in the second commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. We are there required to praise that holy name and to call upon it in every need or to pray. Or to call on the name of God is nothing else to, than to pray. Believers call upon the name of the Lord. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Luther continues, prayer is therefore as strictly and earnestly commanded as all the other commandments to have no other God, not to kill, not to steal, and so forth. Let no one think that it is all the same whether he prays or not and ask, why should I pray? Who knows whether God heeds or will hear my prayer? If I do not pray, someone else will. And thus they fall into the habit of never praying. He really gets to the nub of it, doesn't he? As one of my sainted professors used to say, he has his finger on the neuron of, of my, my thoughts and my will because he points to the problem. He has the nub. And he doesn't, uh, he's not afraid to say what needs to be said. I don't think you and I think of prayer as something God commanded as much as you and I, I hope, think of prayer as something that God has given to us as a privilege. What a privilege to carry what? Everything. Everything. Yeah. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, oh what a shame we bear. Yeah. All because we, we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And I think if you just put the words of that hymn in, in, your, in your thoughts, if you get a copy of it off the internet and print it, you would not go without prayer. What go ahead, Chair. What hymn was that? What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. So it's uh, the friend that we have uh, named Jesus is encouraging our prayer. I don't know. Uh, Luther said in another place, we don't know what mighty and great things have been done through prayer because we don't stop to look back at what we asked for and we don't realize that that thing that is happening right now is a mighty answer. Many things are done for, with, with prayer that cannot be done any other way because it's God's people calling upon God who alone can help and comes with his help. He really does answer prayer. I shouldn't have to say that. I guess I'm not only speaking to you who have joined us today, but also to those who will tune in later on, whose hearts I do not know as well. I spoke to someone this week who said in the email back um, that this person is watching later on during the week. And this person was never a member of our class upstairs, never came upstairs. Wow. 
So I'm asking you to share, if you will, the times when you did not feel like praying and you put it off. Well, sometimes when I'm just got too much on my plate, I just don't have a minute to think to pray. Ah, uh, I understand. The mind is going. Anxiety is high. Yep. Someone else. I think sometimes that when I pray after getting into bed, I then I start worrying about thinking more about what I've just prayed for. And that interrupts sleep. So then I go, okay, I won't do that at bedtime because it interrupts my sleep. So <clears throat> I find praying during the day is better for me. Uh -huh. When I'm worried and I can't sleep, Perry Como is singing now in my head. Yeah. I, I count, count my blessings. Count my blessings. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not, not the sheep. Yeah. No. And one thing that people have discovered, and I've used it successfully many times, is when the thoughts are multiplying, I can pray about them. But then the next thing I must do, and this may be helpful to some of you, is I concentrate only on my breathing. And there is a phrase that is in the Bible, uh, take no thought. That's in Matthew 6. Take no thought for what you're going to eat or wear and so forth. All right. Take no thought. Now, that's the King James translation. Do not worry. Yeah, it means don't worry. But here's the idea. Take no thought. So that's what I do. I refuse to take the thought that is coming. And instead, I listen to my breathing. It is a very boring thing. And if you're not tired, it won't work. But if it's 2 o'clock in the morning and you're going, I may sound silly to you, but it. Um, there's no more prayer to be said. Now I'm just going back to sleep. Lord, you take care of those things. I'm going to go back to sleep. And there are some things, and I won't tell you which things they are, and one of them is not my cancer. That does not keep me awake. But there are some things that I think about that if I let myself go down those trains, I will be on that track for a long time, and I might as well get up and do something else because it's not going to stop. So I take no thought about that. I don't let that thought come in. I listen to my music. 20 to 22 times a minute. Less per minute if it's deep breathing. It's also good for you that you get oxygen. So it's not a bad thing. You try it. Share the times when you did not feel like praying. I don't know if it's that you did not feel like praying, but as someone else said, it, it, was, it just didn't come to mind. And so to train ourselves to have it come to mind is important. All right. Good idea. I think we're talking about everyday <laughs> Christian life is prayer optional. So now we need to consider how many, many times there were many, many needs for prayer and there was an opportunity for prayer, but we did not pray. Yeah. Here's my question. Why? I ask it gently, not accusingly. I am not waving my finger at you. I am joining you in the morning, didn't I? I think where sometimes we feel 
we might feel inadequate, especially if it's somebody that's uh, a new Christian, maybe not even a Christian, when you're just out and about in a group and they'll say, you know, I'm really struggling with this. And instead of just stopping right there and saying, let's pray about it, or we're embarrassed to do it in front of all these other people, they'll think, you know, we're a hypocrite for doing it. I guess we start letting the devil sit on our shoulder and uh, give us reasons why we shouldn't do it too sometimes. Um, uh, in that respect. Uh -huh. uh, being self-conscious about our prayer. Mm -hmm. That's something we might want to pray about mm -hmm. <laughs> privately. Mm -hmm. It's not about you. No, I think Pastor Tony has, you know, really helped us a lot over the years to be able to just stop and pray right there about it instead of waiting or praying even over the telephone. Uh, yeah. We sometimes don't think, I don't know, we just don't think about that. We can pray over the telephone with someone, especially now in the pandemic time when we can't be together. Uh, yes, certainly. And you can offer a prayer for someone on, on a, a message or in an email mm -hmm. or some other means of uh, um, social networking, um, whatever you do, mm -hmm. you can use it as a means of praying for someone and type a little prayer there. Mm -hmm. Or just the assurance, I am praying for you. I just want you to know that. If you call someone and say, uh, you were in my prayers this morning. That means a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate your sharing. Is prayer optional? No. In fact, we pray, and I'm going to give you six reasons. <laughs> Number one, because we just had it, didn't we? God commands us to pray. And this is the Bible verse to which Martin Luther was alluding to. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will glorify me. I want to take that last phrase in Psalm 50, verse 15. Call upon me in the day of trouble. That's, that's, that's the command. Remember the command with the invitation that we studied a few weeks ago? When God says, call upon me, it's a command, but he's also uh, promising that he's going to listen, right? Mm -hmm. And when are you going to do that? In the day of trouble. Ah, oh, every day is a day of trouble. <laughs> okay. But what's the last phrase? And I will deliver you. Deliver is a, a great Old Testament word for God coming to his people and taking them in his loving arms and covering them and, and, and helping them and, and saving them and curing them. And all those words of deliverance are there in that word, I will deliver you. You and I think delivery has to do with Amazon. <laughs> They they come to our house on the average of one once a week. We love it. Uh, anyway, uh, call upon God. That's the first reason for prayer. We pray because God commands. And second, because Jesus taught his disciples to pray our Father, as he himself prayed and also taught many times about prayer. We'll do that more in more detail the next time. He taught his people, his, those who followed him and believed in him. He taught them to pray. He didn't leave it as an option. He didn't wait for St. Paul to come along and talk about prayer. He himself taught them to pray, especially when they asked him, teach us to pray as John, they meant John the Baptist, taught his disciples to pray. I didn't know that. It's nowhere else in the New Testament except them referring to it after the fact they came as his disciples and then became Jesus disciples because the Lord God has promised to hear taking our burdens upon himself and answering in mercy that means he comes to us when we couldn't do it for ourselves 
and according to his wonderful and perfect will for us. So you you say this is a, a prayer promise. That's one reason that we pray. The fourth reason is because of so many great and continuing needs, our own and others' needs. Can you give examples? Oh. Oh, when we started this uh, before our lesson, there were many needs uh, that were expressed. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you could have named another dozen if we had paused and uh, we just sat there quietly thinking of other prayer requests. You and I have uh, two kinds of lists. Uh, one is very personal and very close to us uh, and things that we probably wouldn't put on uh, others' lists. And then we have very public requests for prayer that we would share with just about anyone. Not all of the prayer that I have I put on the list of, uh, that we had this morning. And you have some personal needs. But our world is so full of trouble. It always has been and always will be. Take the long view of history, I have often told you. Take God's long view of history. It doesn't have to be completed today. It won't be completed today. And some of the things that are troubling us, we will simply have to endure. With God's strength, we will be able to hold up under those stresses and under those threats and under those, uh, with those discomforts. I don't know whether that makes it easier, but we pray because there are so many needs. Make a list and keep it up to date. We pray because in praying we confess our faith in and our dependence upon the Lord God, who alone is able and willing to supply all our needs and the needs of others, I should have added. Philippians 4.19, one of my favorite passages, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in grace in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19. You see, when we pray to God, he is hearing us express our dependence and our faith upon him. The Lord loves to hear us pray partly for this reason. He knows that we believe and now we are demonstrating it to him and perhaps to others around us if our prayer is public or semi-public between us and someone else that we love and God has brought us alongside of to care for. Spoke with someone on the phone this week and I, I just could not get in tune with this other person's statement of the problem. We weren't connecting and uh, it was very frustrating. And in between words, I was trying to figure out how to pray for this person. Over the phone is not the same as in person. And that's why we're praying for a quick end to COVID-19. Please, Lord. So that we can get on with many mercies and many ministries, bring the plague to an end. We pray because there are countless blessings for which we want to give thanks and praise to God, the giver from whom all blessings flow. I'm waiting for the offering to end and the people of God to stand up and sing the common doxology. <laughs> yeah, that's the song. So pray that list. Pray the list of blessings if you don't know what else to pray. Thank you, God, for life and breath, for food and drink, for house and home, for fields, cattle, and all my goods. Oops, I slipped into the small catechism there. That's all right. Mm -hmm. 
Is prayer optional? No. Why do Christians pray? Should we ever ask what is the purpose of prayer? You want to hear Luther when he's in a sarcastic mood? No one yes. ever asks. No, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no one ever asks what is the purpose of breathing or why I should allow my heart to beat. So if God's people never ask the why pray question, it wouldn't be necessary for the scriptures to exhort us to pray. We have a lazy flesh, a sinful, lazy flesh that would just as soon not pray. And it resists and it procrastinates. And it says, it doesn't matter if I pray now. If you don't know about that moment in your life when that comes, pray about that at least until the Lord gives you a quiet moment to put aside all the anxieties that are bothering you and bring them to the Lord God who in Christ has redeemed you from your sin and made you, made you righteous in his sight so that he can now listen to you and is willing to listen to you and pray. Any closing thoughts? Pastor, I have one regarding uh, what Judy had said earlier. If someone had said regarding praying before uh, going to bed. Uh, Alan Cook, my seventh grade teacher and the former minister of music at Trinity for in the 70s, 80s, uh, he had us uh, read... Uh, or uh, say Martin Luther's evening prayer each each day after uh, our last class before we left. And can I just say that now? And if uh, people want to join me, that oh, I wish you would. And and and, and that would be a, a very fitting way for us to to close today. Go ahead. Okay. I will say that uh, the little prologue in the evening when you go to bed, you are to make the sign of the Holy Cross and say, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, watch over me, amen. Then kneeling or standing, say the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. If you wish, you may, in addition, recite this little prayer as well. And here's the prayer. I give thanks to you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously protected me today and I ask to you to forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously to protect me tonight. For into your hands I commend myself, my body, my soul, and all that is mine. Let your holy angel be with me so that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. 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 Talk to you next time. Thank you for being with us, Pastor Larson, and a group of wonderful people who pray. Bye-bye.